Hello. Uh, it's so great to be here and uh, to have the opportunity to share some of my kiwiness with all of you. And uh, and uh, I think the objective is to uh, uh, inspire. So, who am I? Um, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am, and then I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about my exploits uh, in the world. So, um, my name is Linda Jenkinson, and I come from the Manawatu. I come from Bunnythorpe, halfway between Hewanui and Ashurst. Uh, and uh, for you orcs out there, uh, Palmerston North, uh, this is uh, our local dump. And I don't know if you've all heard of Monty Python, but uh, one of those guys showed up in Palmerston North and he said, if you want to commit suicide, go and live in Palmerston North. So we uh, named the dump after John Cleese. And uh, the challenge is, you know, when I'm in the US or when I'm speaking around the world, nobody knows where Palmerston North is or Hiwanui or Bunnythorpe but they all know John Cleese. And uh, my, my big party trick when I used to live in Boston is they'd all come up and go, go where did you go to school? And, uh, and I'd go uh, on Massey University and they'd go, oh, never heard of it. And I said, oh, well, where did you go to school? And they'd go, oh, Harvard, oh, never heard of it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> there we go. But um, with that, so um, I'm a living example of Kiwis taking it on uh, in the world. When I was 23 years old and sitting in Wellington, my boss said to me, you know, what do you, what do you want to do with your life? And audacious that I was, it was I wanted to make a difference and change the world. And uh, that's what I've always been about, but doing it in a real Kiwi way, having a lot of fun and doing it with a lot of style. So um, I am the first New Zealand woman to take a company public on the NASDAQ. Uh, I've raised more than $300 million. I'm really good at getting people to give me money. I, I take it to my years at Massey University where um, I never paid for a drink. I took that on as a special <laughs> point of pride. And that skill set really has served me well. Um, so Unlimited Magazine, you know, the, uh, it calls me a serial entrepreneur and it does make me sound like I'm going to be arrested soon. But what does that really mean? So I'm going to, uh, I've built three global uh, companies, multi-million dollar companies, and I've also built a uh, social venture and I'm still on that mission. So I've got five company babies and two babies and cats and dogs and lots of Klingons. So let me um, tell you a little bit about them. So the first one, Dispatch Management Services. Um, global, uh, as a company we started in New Zealand and I'm going to tell you a pile about it, but basically built on a Kiwi uh, idea, a Kiwi technology, Kiwi operations, and, uh, and we took it to the world. And uh, that was my team uh, in New York City just after we listed. Um, uh, Porthos. So Porthos uh, was, we built um, one of the first online high-end wine companies uh, in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, it started, uh, you know, everyone always says, well, where do you get your ideas from, right? And uh, this was, I was on holiday in the south of France and just discovered Saturn and couldn't figure out how I didn't know about it. And we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a company that this could be a tax deductible thing? And, uh, you know, it's great, great ideas. Um, and um, in America, America at that time really drank spirits and beer. So we decided that we would teach the Americans how to drink wine. And so we started Porthos. And um, it, the concept was uh, the long tail, and that was right when email marketing was just started. And it took us about 18 months. We uh, started it in our garage. and. Uh, it took us about 18 months to figure out that Americans actually were completely uninterested in New Zealand wine because they all had a sweet tooth, they drank a lot of coke, sweet coke, and so they liked sweet wine. So we started um, selling, selling that uh, and uh, built it to a multi-million dollar company uh, based on that. So um, the next uh, baby is uh, John Paul. So interestingly enough, you know, we were just hearing all about the incredible story of the Pacific Islands. Well, um, 
One of the th concepts I love about the Pacific Islands is the VAR, which is the space in between. It's about relationships and what happens in the alchemy of when you come together. Well, John Paul started as a company called I Say So, and I had the idea looking at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and it came down to, you know, I used to travel the world restructuring banks, and uh, everyone always wanted to know what my husband was doing, because everybody else, you know, stayed in a Marriott and flew back to New York, and we always found some grouse apartment, found, you know, the coolest thing to do, and uh, discovered the world on the same size of expense account. So with um, I Say So, we decided that we'd set up a company to show Americans how to live, because, you know, they only got two weeks holiday, and they used to go to Columbus, and we used to go to Paris for the weekend. So I Say So was a company about um, showing that if you authentically build relationships with your employees and your customers, that actually that was the basis. It didn't really matter what your technology was, it was about your culture. And so got, have gone on to build this to, um, we, we now have one of the first technology-enabled uh, concierge companies in the world. Uh, we work with uh, major, uh, 150 major brands, uh, so some of the stats on us, we're uh, in uh, five continents. We have more than 1,000 employees uh, and a 29-year legacy, uh, patented technology. So once again, services, technology, global. Uh, and these are some of our clients, you know, the biggest brands in the world, showing them how to connect with their employees. Uh, Apple Computer, when Steve Jobs died, they called us up and said, we need to figure out how to connect with our employees. So we deployed a program globally, and funny enough, they don't want the mobile piece, they want the human interaction, and that's what our company does for Apple in terms of making it a, an, a better place. So um, that's John Paul. We're um, currently probably exiting that in the next two to three years, but really doing some amazing things with it uh, globally. So that's uh, baby number three. The next one, uh, wow investments. So um, I, I sort of talked about my driver is to make a difference in the world. And I do that whether it's in the for-profit space, on the non-profit non space. Uh, wow was something that we created in the middle. Uh, in basically the concept of putting for-profit and non-profit together where we went and built business incubators in West Africa to um, help African women uh, give them the skills, the community, the um, IP they needed to then pair that with low interest loans and grants and equity to build medium sized businesses uh, in West Africa. One of the most amazing things I've ever done, learned a hell of a lot, uh, and along the way, um, you know, spent 23 weeks in Africa learning about how to grow things in places where we think we're entrepreneurial and we've got it hard. You've got no idea what it's like for these women in terms of what they have to do to build a business. Uh, and it took me to some amazing places as well. Uh, Muhammad Yunus uh, invented, you know, microfinance. Spent a pile of time with him in terms of how to translate that concept into SME finance and because in West Africa microfinance didn't work because you can build more mangoes but if you don't have logistics and manufacturing and plants it just uh, it just started to feed on itself. Um, also had the privilege of working with the president of Liberia. Hey, I didn't know that um, 23 weeks in Africa and restructuring the biggest banks and knowing how to build businesses, a little bit overwhelmed when you're sitting there with the founder of Yahoo and the first black billionaire in, Afri in, in America and uh, uh, Soros and talking about how do you rebuild Liberia and realize that after I've figured out how to put my little thing up to say when I want to speak, which the president kindly educated me on how to do, much to my embarrassment. Had a lot to offer as a Kiwi because how many people know how to build small businesses, have spent time in Africa and uh, know how to work on the global stage. So an incredible experience. Once again, just wanting to help and take my skill set to uh, Senegal and Dakar and the end of the road in, in uh, Guinea. So, uh, but that's baby number four. Wow, wow, and Wolof means yes. So, uh, yes for Africa, yes for business, yes for woman. A lot of the themes of my life. 
Um, so one of my latest babies, Globlet. So Globlet is a New Zealand-based company growing it out of Christchurch, and Globlet's vision is to imagine a world without disposable cups. And for a lot of you here who are a hell of a lot younger than I am, you've only ever lived in the world of disposables. But for a lot of us, you know, we had the we were the day of the the milk bottle, etc. And so uh, the world's changed, technology's changed, integrating some of the best in kind uh, manufacturing. Uh, virtual reality, some of these other elements, we've come up with a business model that we can do cheaper than disposables. So watch that space, global, global it. Uh, so um, I'm also a mother and a wife. There are my two small children, one of them's in uh, New Zealand and one of them's in Sydney. I'm a global citizen. Lived in 23 different uh, countries around the world and um, my kids have, since they've been seven years old, have been shipping themselves around. Um, I'm an innovator, and uh, this is one of my early innovations. <laughs> this is a very, for any of you who have ever done, be, I come from a farm, and um, one of the jobs that, there's all these jobs that the chicks get, so I was the chick which I used to really aggravate me because I wanted to do all the guy things. But, uh, so I always came up with the next smart way to approach it, right? So, an innovator. So everybody else gets all the little lambs, you know, you've got to get up at five in the morning, all night, feed them with little bottles. I thought, bugger that. So I, uh, and that's uh, French, um, <laughs> I taught my sheep how to self-feed in the cow shed. And that means that they could drink whenever they wanted. So they were at least twice as big as everybody else's. <laughs> and as you can see there, I did very well at the Fielding AMP show. My family thought I was a cheat. I thought that I was just coming up with a different yeah. approach. <laughs> I was never really into getting up at 5 a.m. in those days. So I was an innovator from day one. Uh, so um, another thing, who am I? I am a gun poker player, although I will never admit it outside of this room. Uh, but uh, this is going to be important because it's going to be a theme to some of the things that I tell you about. Um, so now, that's who I am. There's lots and lots of other parts to me, um, but uh, they're the big ones for today. So three stories for you. The first one is called, My Reluctant Grandmother Teaches Me How to Play Poker. So um, my, family, my, my parents conceived me when they were very young and uh, the first time my grandmother learned about me was when my father threw me on the bed and said, here's your granddaughter. Needed to say I was a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, you know, it was uh, in New Zealand, you know, the big thing is what, you're 21st? I think I got a pair of pantyhose from her. So you get the sense that, you know, I wasn't high in the ranking system of the grandchildren. But, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, I wanted to have a picture of my grandmother to show you with me, but I realised that there was never actually one. So, um, so you have to deal with the piece of paper. But anyway, she was a keen card player, and when I was five years old, she taught me how to play poker. And, um, and it was a great gift. It was better than anything that she could have ever given me. Um, and, because, uh, you know, it's... If you think about business and the world, it's math, it's strategy, it's psychology, it's understanding people, it's being able to bluff, it's knowing when to go for the clothes and when not. Um, so uh, it's business as we know it. You know, I'm on the board of the Massey Foundation in the US and I've been trying to convince them to integrate poker into the business management classes. I have not yet been successful, but it's their loss. But watch the space, okay? So after graduating from Massey University with a BBS, there's my proud graduation photo, um, I moved to Wellington and uh, John Green, an amazing guy, one of my first mentors, um, he uh, called me up and he goes, hey, um, these are Americans and uh, national banks just called and they don't know what to do with them. So they want someone to go and sort them out. So I'm a good stroppy Kiwi farm chick. So I was the one that was nominated and I met this guy called Greg Kidd. 
And don't forget that name because that's going to be another theme of my um, speaking. But being a good Kiwi, I uh, gave them the hospitality, showed them around Wellington, realised they had very large expense accounts and, and demonstrated for me and all of my mates on how to spend it. Um, and uh, early that morning we, we started playing poker and of course I'd forgotten how to play beat them, took their money, oh, what good beginner's luck. Um, and I uh, really got to know these guys and uh, had the pleasure of uh, working with them on restructuring data bank and ba banking systems. And so one day Greg Kitt and I were at Oriental Parade in Wellington and he goes, you know, why don't we start a billion dollar company? And I thought, why not? Okay. So I said, oh, well, who's going to be the CEO? And he says, well, you know, you're good at doing things. Why don't you be? And I said, OK, why not? So we um, decided, so we had a vision, a billion dollar company. We had no idea what we were going to do. We went and looked at four or five things and we said, OK, what are the things in New Zealand that are world class? And um, Data Bank, because we had central clearing, we had the most efficient courier, on-demand courier system in the world. We figured out. We went and benchmarked it globally, did it, did it. So we went and uh, bought this little company. I can still remember, you know, you do like your accounting degree, but then how, how do you value a company? What does it look like? And um, we went and um, hired a couple of developers and we built some technology and we figured out why it was different and we built a business model for it. Um, and then we decided that we would take, conquer the world, a billion dollars, that's what we were going after. Uh, one of my investors um, did it, did it, so let's see, this is a, oh, I'm going too fast here. So one of my investors was a Cincinnati billionaire, and uh, his name was Fred Myerson, and uh, he bet me that, uh, be betting again, right, that I couldn't launch it and take it public, because of course he would make a hell of a lot of money if, I, if, we, if we took it out ultimately, because he was one of our primary investors. And so I said, okay, why don't we have a bet? And he says, all right, put your money where your mouth is. So I said, all right, then I want a Porsche Carrera if, we, if I do it. And he said, okay, shook hands. And um, one week after we went public, I got it with a big red bow. Um, so, uh, as I said, poker, betting, uh, that was a really good day. Uh, you know, there's nothing like it uh, standing there in Oriental Parade. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I went to Wellington was my dad built like $22 million businesses, which was not an insignificant accomplishment in Palmerston North. Uh, he started with five quid and a Model T. But... Um, he could never figure out how to make them bigger, and so I always wanted to do that. So that was really part of who I was, you know, and it paid off. So here's me um, on CNN about three weeks after we listed. And uh, I come from New Zealand, which is the funny accent, and uh, 10 years ago we were working on restructuring the banking industry and found that the productivity of couriers in New Zealand was four times higher than anywhere else in the world. So we actually developed a proprietary software system and an operations model tested it in New Zealand for three years and then came to the US four years ago and actually rolled it through 22 companies in the US prior to going public. So we're actually, 22 of the 40 companies are in our network are already operating on our platform and are operating at productivity levels two to four times higher than the average company in America. So voila, DMS, my first big baby. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, that all sounds so bloody rosy, doesn't it? So let me give you the rest of it. Uh, that was the poker thing again with the car. So, uh, but here we go. So now we're heading into my biggest challenge. So this is three months before that happy day. It's November the 7th, 1997, and I get a phone call from our investment bank, and they've basically decided to pull. They don't want to take us public. And uh, that wasn't so good. It was a huge blow. You know, we'd spent seven years working on this thing. Uh, I'd given up partnership, you know, seven-figure salary. My husband still mourns the expense account. Um, and I was in London trying to raise money, and uh, the deadline for the IPO was looming. Uh, that day, it always happens, you know, in threes. Well, my American Express card got cut off. Everyone talks about funding strategies. Well, 125000 that time they cut me off. 
Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I thought, gosh, well, it couldn't get any worse, could it? And uh, it did. I crossed the road, looked the wrong way, and got fit by a taxi, broke my back in three places, as well as my pelvis. I'm like, you know, your life is going in one direction one minute, and next minute, shit. Once again, that's a French. Um, so I regrouped, um, got a pile of pills, um, a bit of uh, stage makeup, because, you know, investors don't like it. Uh, and then I um, uh, regrouped, called the number two bank, number three bank, heard, and um, convinced them they should take us out. Um, and I did that, um, let's see. We're going to get there. There we go, from the bath. This is a really great place to meditate. You can see there the, uh, the uh, crutches, because you had plenty of uh, pills I could figure out how to stumble about. So, um, and then uh, there are good things that come out of bad, is that because I couldn't walk, instead of taking commercial, they got us that private jet, and we got to jet around like 23 cities. So as long as, you know, I got wheeled into each of the, uh, the meetings, then I could look, you know, uh, good enough to, to give the pitch. And that's uh, Greg Kidd, that guy I told you about, you know, that American that I had to sort out. So um, off we went. Now, um, poker does come back into it. We ended up paying all of our bankers about $4 million. So we invented a game of Indian poker with 2,000 feet to go. And uh, we managed to fleece them of five grand. They never worked our system out. But hey, it made me feel better because, you know, $4 million, it's a pretty big check. Anyway, um, good at bluffing, what can I say? So, um, but still, we re really there. Um, we, uh, I put everything on the line at this point, right? Because my Amex was cut off. Uh, my health was pretty much shot. And uh, seven years and everything put into this company. And when you list a, a company, they have this thing called the book, and you've got to get orders for at least twice your book. So you want to sell four million shares, you've got to get eight million putting their name down so you can create a market. So we've got three days to go, and we've only sold half our book. Basically means that we're not going public. So talking about, you know, uh, looking, looking, uh, looking that in the eye and thinking, oh. So anyway, we didn't have a lot to lose at this point. So um, we walk uh, into one of our last meetings, and it's uh, in New York uh, on the top floor. And I walk in, and there's a guy with a bow tie. I can still picture it to this day. And then there's this guy in the corner with you know, hair up here, and he's playing with a computer. And we think, oh, it's a tech guy. And so this guy with the bow tie throws this report onto the conference room table. And he goes, oh, that, oh, that was me after I won the five grand, by the way. See, uh, I've got all my blankets on and things, but there we go. But here we go. And what did he say to me? He said, why should I invest in a company that's run by a woman? All this research shows that women do not make good CEOs. And I'm thinking at this point, you know what? <laughs> what is there to lose? So Greg and I, we go for it. We roll our sleeves up. We hold nothing back. And uh, halfway through, we realized that that guy in the corner is pulling up what's called the comps, all the companies that have failed in our sector, and he's showing the curves of their, of their uh, stock prices going down to see how we're going to react. Um, so uh, uh, I tell him why I'm going to be a great CEO. I tell him why we have got the, the business model that why you know, we are able to professionalize careers, that we create the best product at the best price with the best deal for our labor force. Um, so uh, we finished the meeting, went downstairs. We're standing there talking to our investment bankers, you know, what next? And uh, pain pills are starting to sort of run off. And the elevator door opens, and the guy with the bow tie, he walks out. He comes up, and uh, at least this time I wasn't mistaken for the cleaning lady, which happened quite a bit, especially when I was in my, the London part of the roadshow. But he puts his arm around me, and he goes, bloody good job. We just put an order in for the whole book. So we listed. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it's um, the moral of the story is, you know, you talk about, you know, resilience or uh, the eye of the tiger or what it takes. Uh, that's what it takes, you know, and, the, and you go under the covers of every entrepreneur and they've got these sorts of stories. So, um, pretty amazing. So, once again, the bluff, the poker, the going for it, um, that's what it's about. So, um, you know, so they talk about luck, but, you know, we had, uh, it was about 
hard work uh, based on a great business model. Okay, so the last story is called, uh, it's about connecting the dots, it's about connections. And, um, you know, I've always had this real ethos of I want to make a difference and I haven't really, in this uh, brief 20 minutes, I haven't had time to really focus on each of my babies to tell you how they did make a difference, but I can assure you that in different ways they all did. Um, but back to, I'm going to like show you some of the things that came out of some of the things that I've done. So when I um, finished school in Palmerston North, back then women became teachers, secretaries or nurses. And so I dutifully went off to secretarial school and the good news is I can still type at 80 minute, words a minute with my eyes closed. Um, but um, uh, I went and uh, did my secretarial school and uh, I got a job with Jacobs, Florentine and Maloney in Palmerston North and I was on the switchboard and um, answering the phones and this one day this old guy started chasing me around the table and now I would be quite, you know, pleasurably, you know, I take it as a compliment. Back then I was mortally offended that that would happen to me. So I walked out and um, as a point of inspiration and one of the reasons why I always talk to people as when I was at high school, I remember at Palmerston North Girls High, some professors from Massey came and talked about university. And I was the first person in my family to stay at school past the age of 15. I got flowers for school C, but after that it was all done, let alone when I did my masters in the US. But um, so I decided I was gonna go to Massey University and I was gonna do the most practical thing I could do. Computer science was the future and I was going to do, learn how to handle money, so accounting and finance. And um, on my first day at Massey, in my first computer science class, one of those crazy guys with all the hair, he had a whole pile of shoe boxes and a whole pe pile of pieces of paper, and he demonstrated how a computer works, and you could put that onto the cloud today or whatever, it's all the same concepts. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I've been building technology-based businesses, I, I, I tune it back to the, um, the, the uh, shoe boxes with the pieces of paper. Uh, so I learned how a computer works, how to connect those dots. Um, and um, if you, the, the business system that we developed, which enabled us to take DMS to a half a billion dollars in size, in valuation, um, you know, we acquired more than 67 companies, we had six and a half thousand employees in more than 80 cities. Um, the essence of that chaos management system um, uh, came from, you know, the ability to apply, you know, what I learned at Massey. Um, so while we were at DMS, uh, we got hacked one day by this audacious young man who wanted a job from St. Louis, Missouri, and his name was Jack Dorsey. And we thought he was so cheeky, it was a very interesting way of getting a job, so take note, those of you who are students here. Uh, we flew him to New York, and um, we offered him a job. And it turns out he was obsessed with a dispatch technology. And um, after DMS, when uh, I took a sabbatical and went off drinking wine and came up with the idea for our online wine company, Greg went and teamed up with Jack and invested, and Jack started a company called Twitter. Uh, and Twitter, if you uh, go back to the early articles of Twitter, you'll see that Jack talks about what he learned at DMS in terms of the messaging capability that we had and developed with our 6,000 courier messages that was some of his thinking behind um, Twitter. And as you know, you know, uh, um, so anyway, so Greg, um, uh, who I'm still in touch with, um, emailed me a while ago. And uh, it really touched my heart in terms of my ethos of making a difference. And uh, what he basically said was, um, you know, you played a hugely important role in all of this and I'm eternally thankful to you and realise that all that has followed uh, wouldn't be possible without what you did. So in terms of, you know, goals of, can you believe, you know, starting something in New Zealand on Oriental Parade, you know, through the dots and connections, the people that you're able to influence and the things that get created from that. So, um, you know, I am a proud Kiwi and I've got so many to, people to thank in terms of who have inspired me along the way. 
Um, it is all about connections, it's about making a difference, it's about being authentic to who you are. And we as New Zealanders are absolutely, uh, we have so many skills and we're so set up to do and to create because of who we are. Uh, you know, you, you can bet on yourself, uh, the number eight wire, the innovation, but also the ability to go out in the world and make things happen. And that is consistent to all of the world-class New Zealanders that you'll meet. Um, don't give up. Resilience, you've heard just one of my stories. I've got 20 more of them. But uh, after you've done it for a while, you realize there's always an, the other end of it and you always learn so much of it and it always enables you to go to the next place. Um, and everything is connected and comes back to the circle of gratitude. So thank you very much uh, for um, giving me the opportunity to share um, my story of Kiwi innovation and taking it to the world and uh, delighted to be in the circle of coming back to New Zealand and, uh, and uh, starting all over again. So thank you.